now we are going to talk about advanced technique. So uh, let's also remember internal rate of return. Internal rate of return measures what is the cost of capital at which NPV is zero. And it is going to work fantastic if we have just one cash outflow. If we have one cash outflow and then inflows, then everything is simple. But what can happen is that you are going to have outflows, then inflows, outflows, then inflows. And it means that when you choose higher interest rate, this means that your future outflows are going to be reduced and so will be future inflows. So this basically means that there can be multiple internal rate of returns. And this means that users will can, the users can get to the wrong assumption, to the wrong opinion. So modified internal rate of return is not going to work. Another problem is that sometimes our reinvestment rate differs from the rate that we use when we want to borrow money. Like you borrow money at 10%, but your projects bring you 15%. So it would be logical to take into the consideration that an internal rate of return does not deal with different interest rates. That's why we should use modified internal rate of return. The formula is like that. Mm, sounds scary, not so much. So the idea is that you are going to uh, increase the values, uh, that you are going to take the values of uh, reinvestment stage and you are going over return stage and you're going to divide it by present value of investment stage. And that will be taken into the power of one divided by n and multiplied by one plus this return, uh, this cost of capital minus one. So why is a modified internal rate of return so important? Let's have a look at it once again. That is because it deals with the fact that internal rate of return can sometimes have more than one result. Also, the fact that other projects will be reinvested at weighted average cost of capital and not at internal rate of return is taken into account. And finally, the, cost, the cost of cash outflow can be higher than interest income from cash inflow, and we should account for that. Now, we have this short practice where we have the, the outflows like that. We have a major outflow in the end because, let's say, we need to engage in site restoration. And when we calculate internal rate of return, we will find out that the results can be confusing. So let me rewrite the cash flow. So it's minus 1,000, 1,000, 1,100, 1,300, 1,100 and minus 3,700. Now, when I calculate internal rate of return using a formula, you have probably seen that not only we take values, but also we take a guess. So if I put as a guess, let's say 10%, my internal rate of return is five. If I use as a guess 70%, my internal rate of return is 82. Let's double check. Okay, so let me put here 5%. Let me put here 82%. And I will calculate, I will discount that. So the first um, is not to discount it. So it's, uh, let me just uh, put the years here. So we assume that the first cash flow happens right now. So in period T0. And these are the years. So we are going to take this minus 1,000. We are going to divide it by 1 plus this uh, rate. I'm going to fix that. Taken into the period that equals to the number of the year. I'm going to make sure that I fixed everything that was supposed to be fixed. I'm going to calculate the amounts. I am going to calculate the total value. And you will see that the total values, 
and sorry, not this weight, but rather this weight. Okay, up one second. Bow with me for a second. Up. Well, you will see these uh, MPVs are very close to zero. Uh, they are not exactly zero, but that is because we have some rounding effect. So the rates are not exactly 5% and 82, but maybe 502 or 488. We do not know that, but still like minus three and three is practically zero. So you see, we have MPV equal in zero for two different rates. And this means that the results are very confusing. So will this project bring us 82% or 5%? Mm, who knows? Now, what we can do, we can calculate modified internal rate of return. So once again, to calculate modified internal rate of return using the cost of capital of 15%. Let me go back to the formula here so that it's right in front of your eyes. And we are going to calculate the present value of return phase. So present value of return phase is, I am going to put here this 15% uh, cost of capital. And the return phase in my case is the amounts that are positive. So I'm going to take, let's say this thousand, I'm going to divide that by one plus this very rate. And I'm going to take it into the power that equals to the number of the year. Up, here we go. So that will be the return phase. And present value of the return phase is going to be the total of that. We need to calculate the present value of investment phase. And we have two investments. We have one that happens today at T0 and one that happens in period five. Double check that formulas are all right. And we are going to total that. And we are going to receive one more present value. Now let's calculate what we have in here. So we are, that will go with the minus sign in here so that we have positives. Now modified internal rate of return is, I take the return phase, I divide it by the investment phase. I take it into the power of one divided by number of years, which in my case is five, I multiply it by one plus cost of capital and I subtract one. So it gives me the real return, this modified return of 17%. So if money is uh, uh, reinvested at 15%, then my modified internal rate of return is going to be 17. Another way to do that is to inflate your return phase to the last period and discount your investment phase to the first period. Divide one by one and look at the annuity table and find out what is the, the annuity factor, that, uh, sorry, not the annuity, the discount factor that is there, that is reflected. But we're going to limit ourselves with the formula. Okay. So that is how it works. That is our modified internal rate of return. Uh, and in the next video, we're going to talk about investment decisions. So I will see you next. Bye.